now. Here's Brian Windhorst back on the Rich Eisen Show prior to Game 5 in Cleveland and a series that everybody thought would not come back to Cleveland after they left Cleveland. And I'm wondering, are you one of those people, Brian, as well? Rich, I never, ever, ever predict a sweep. And a lot of times I'm wrong because um, there's sweeps all the time. The Cavs swept two, get two teams in the first um, first two rounds. But um, I always give teams the belief that if they've gotten to this point, uh, whether it's in the first round or the fourth and third round, that they they can do it. Um, that said, no, I didn't expect the Cavs to have a crucial game five here. It's a, it's a huge moment for them, a moment they didn't expect was going to be happening because um, they obviously have the better team. I don't think anybody you know debates that. But – They've made a couple of mistakes. Uh, one mistake is they've let the Raptors get confident because this is a team that uh, tends to waver on confidence. They're they're a team that the, one of the ways uh, one of the one of the things that holds them back sometimes is lack of confidence. And they've also let their defense sort of go. They they had so much success offensively, setting records and stuff through the through the end of the Pistons series, through the Hawks series, and in the first two rounds, that they lost the edge that you need to play with defensively to win a big playoff game, and, and the Raptors took advantage of it. So, you know, at the end of the day, this is a team that won 56 games. This is a team that, that was playing game, playoff games on their home court. That, that's a team that's won two game sevens on their home court already this year. So, you know, I think it, uh, it's not of a surprise that they would push back if the Cavs opened the door. So uh, let's talk about some of these matchups here with, with you, uh, Brian Winhorst. Do we expect to see LeBron on DeRozan uh, 100%? And uh, obviously with switching, we understand that may happen. But is this going to happen here where LeBron shuts him down? So one of the things, I mean, to answer your question, Rich, exactly, um, I do think you'll see that. And I think the Raptors have a whole package of options to get LeBron off of DeRozan. That was a big move that they – that that was their big strategy the other day. Sometimes they would set two screens right in a row just to try to get uh, LeBron off of them. Um, but, frankly, whoever LeBron has not been on, whether it's either Lowry or DeRozan, has had success because uh, J.R. Smith, who was the team's best defensive player on the perimeter night in and night out through the regular season, he has fallen off in this series. And because Kyrie Irving, who is – Never been a good defensive player, nor will he ever be a good defensive player. He, he's, a, he's a star player because of what he does with the ball. Um, but he was working much harder on defense in the earlier stages of the, of the playoffs than he has been uh, in this series. And so they're going to find the weak link and attack it. So the Cavs have just got to get back to playing uh, where they're not totally focused on the offensive end. So what's Kevin Love's status? Kevin Love's status is he's in a slump. <laughs> um, and, you know, he may be dinged up a little bit, uh, but, you know, he, you would think he's going to play better. But when, 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 when the Raptors play with four, you know, relatively small players plus Bismack Biombo, Kevin Love is probably not the best player to have on the court. The, the Cavs have had success with Channing Fry and Tristan Thompson as their big men out there with all shooters for a reason. So, Obviously, Kevin Love has got to do better than four for 14, and um, I think he was maybe one of nine the game before. That's obviously got to get improved. But in this particular series, with the way these two teams are playing, Kevin Love is probably not going to be a huge factor. Um, that's just the reality of it. Before we get to the Congolese conundrum that is uh, presented to the Cavs, I want to hit you on Valanchunas. Do we see him tonight, and if so, how much? Yeah, I think they were planning on playing him in game four the other night, but when Dwayne Casey looked up in the second quarter and saw his team was up 18 points, um, he said, you know what, I think I'm going to stick with what I got. Um, so Valanciunas is, is available and can play. Um, the thing about this, the Raptors have a really great rhythm with what they're doing right now. And not only that, they have already won a series without Valanciunas. So he was their best player through their first um, 10 playoff games, without a doubt. Um, but for their last few games, he hasn't been a part of it. So it's, 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 a, it's a conundrum for Dwayne Casey. But what I think is um, the danger is that Biombo just wears down because you're relying on him so much that if you can get him an extra just three or four minutes on the bench, that maybe it helps them, even if Valanciunas isn't all that effective. Where is Timofey Moskov? Where, where, why is he so buried on the bench when Biombo is going off and clearly Tristan Thompson is having some issues down low to try and combat Biombo. Where is Moskov, Brian? Well, the, 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 I think the, the question for the Cavs is where is Tristan Thompson? They, you know, they gave him an $80 million contract 
um, to to win and and play even at the very least in situations like this. And he's been getting outplayed. Um, that's the thing. With Mazdov, you know, he has not been the same player this season. He had a knee surgery in the off season. Uh, he had a sluggish recovery from that. And frankly, the Cavs have played much much better when they have played with Channing Fry. It's not a matter of um, that he's terrible. It's just a matter of. This team has a lot of talent, and um, when they've gone to this just where they're chucking three-pointers, um, it's better off to play Channing Fry as your backup center. They had a lot of success in the second half of the year um, shooting a high volume of threes. They were the number one offensive team from February onward, and that includes the Warriors, and that was with not much Mazdov in there. So it's a coach's decision, and for the most part, it's been a, a smart coach's decision, and I don't necessarily see that changing in this series at least brian winhorst of vspn joining me here okay so before we but let's button this one up uh what happens you think the Cavs win tonight and it goes to a game six where toronto tries to force game seven is that what you think happens this evening yeah rich i mean i would say that the Cavs would win but I, this is a very unexpected little crucial no point doubt. for them because um if DeRozan and lowry keep scoring 60 points a game it's gonna be hard to beat them i don't care who i don't care who's playing them they were a top five offense. They, they they don't they don't fit the mold of a modern day great offensive player team because they don't shoot a lot of threes. Um, but they have two all star players who, if they get playing like all stars, are a handful. So uh, here is the crux point that we're at right now, Rich. Over the course of time in the NBA, we see teams figure out other teams, and all of a sudden the there's a tipping point and the team can't recover. I don't think we're there because the Cavs were the better team in the second half of game four, and I think they'll carry that over. But the Raptors are so much more confident now. This reminds me of the 2007 Cavaliers team that was fell down 2-0 to the Pistons. They were sort of just happy to be in the conference finals, and all of a sudden they figured out a way to play, and a tipping point was reached, and they beat them four in a row. So is it safe now, to say that is it safe to say that we've reached that figuring out slash tipping point in the Western Conference Finals with the Thunder and um, the Warriors? I I think it's safe to say that. Um, wow. Although the margin for error against the against the Warriors is still so small, um, and so I am going to respect the fact of their talent, and I'm also going to respect that they still have two of the, the remaining three games theoretically at home. And so while I don't see the, the Thunder losing three in a row, considering that they've won seven of their last nine games against the Spurs and Thunder, or mm. against the Spurs and Warriors, I mean, oh, my God, these are, these are two teams that between them won 130 games, this, well, in almost 140 games this last year. And they beat them seven out of the last nine. Um, I'm going to give respect to the fact that the Warriors are still a great team, and I'm not going to declare that over at all. Yeah, and I was saying before that anybody who's wondering about Curry's uh, health is kind of disrespecting Russell Westbrook. I mean, Russell Westbrook is world class in his own right. I, I, I find, you know, I was saying all year long I'm not getting off the Warriors, and just because I'm, I, I can't be jumping ship now, I'm going to stick with them. But I mean, Durant and 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 Westbrook, you want to talk about two guys that will be tough to beat when they score 60 together. I mean, my gosh, Brian, this is remarkable what we're seeing from these guys right now. Yeah, look, I don't know how Steph Curry's knee feels. It's not my knee. So I don't know. Nobody knows but him. Right. He doesn't look like himself. Um, but let me tell you what I'll say is if you were going to say, well, what are the Warriors' weaknesses? It, it, you know, if you were constructing a way to beat them, if you were talking, if we were having this discussion six weeks ago, yes. what would have to happen? I would say, well, you know, they, they are too casual with the ball at times, and they, they can be, they can, because they, they can score so much offensively, they're too casual and they turn the ball over a lot. They have moments where they turn the ball over a lot. That's a weakness. And the second weakness is they're not as good of a defensive team this year as they were last year. Last year, they were the number one defensive team from November through, through June. That was not the case this year, and it was especially not the case in the second half of the season. And so what we've seen in this series turnovers as they've dealt with the length of the of the Thunder and we've seen their defense two seventy point halves in back to back games. I mean that a year ago the, the, the thought of that was un, absolutely unthinkable seventy point halves. So the, the Thunder not only is it just Steph not playing well, but it's the Thunder finding the weaknesses and exposing them. Last one for you, Brian. I know the last time you were on you said that um, that all signs are pointing to Durant signing a one-year deal with Oklahoma City in the offseason and then dealing with full-on free agency uh, the following year. 
could we be five Thunder wins away from him just scrapping that and maybe just signing and staying put? No, I still think the one-year deal makes sense. And I also think that what you say before the buzzer of the season really is just flat, ridiculous conjecture. I don't mean you, Rich. I mean anybody. Nobody really knows how Kevin Durant is going to feel on July 1st until we really get to the end of the season. Uh, the rest of it's just a joke. But from, a, from an economic standpoint, um, any agent could not look Kevin Durant in the eye and say it's not, it's not a good idea to sign a one-year deal. I don't care if he decided he wanted to go to the Lakers or the Blazers or the Raptors or whomever. A one-plus-one, as we call it, one-plus-a-player option is the deal that makes the most sense for a dozen reasons. Brian, thanks for the time. Appreciate it. We'll chat with uh, with you uh, before the finals, hopefully. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. You bet. That's Brian Winhorst, writer on ESPN.com and from the Worldwide Leader in Sports, putting it all out there. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.